Hello and welcome to this edition of Talk Vietnam. Fifty years ago, the whole world was shocked upon seeing photos of women, infant and the elderly, all unarmed civilians slaughtered by American soldiers in a village in central Vietnam. 504 innocent Vietnamese villagers were killed in the Meat Lai massacre that happened on March 16, 1968. I am now within the Sun Mi Memorial Complex in Tinh Khe of Quang Ngai Province. And this is where uh, just moments ago, a ceremony was held in honor of the victims. 50 years on, the Meat Lai Massacre continues to haunt many people about how evil and cruel a war can become and why it is vital that nothing like Meat Lai Massacre ever happen again in the world. Joining me here today is the photographer, Ron Haberly. His photos were the photos that shocked the world 50 years ago, and his photos, as many believe, helped to change the course of the war that took place in Vietnam. Hello, Mr. Haberly. Thank you very much for joining our show today. It's been 50 years since the Meat Lai massacre, and uh, we're back here uh, in Meat Lai. How does it feel each time you come back here? Uh, in a way, it's sort of a strange feeling because I know it you know, transpired on March 16, 1968. That was the date of the massacre. And uh, it seems uh, like I want to feel it never happened. And I start walking around, I start recognizing uh, places that I've known where things have taken place. And it's just a really a strange feeling, but it's a peaceful feeling. Because I, when I come back, I usually come back, I want to pay my respect to the survivors and also to the deceased in my own way. But the first time you came back to Vietnam since you took those photos was in 2000. Um, can you tell us about that trip? What were the emotions going through you? Okay, it was on a bicycle ride. We rode up around Hanoi for a little while, then we uh, flew down to Way, and we started the bike ride from Way to Saigon. And so the people on the bike ride knew who I was. And, you know, I told the story to them, and, I, and we were scheduled to stop and visit the museum. And I told them not to say anything to anyone, not to have any reporters there. And they didn't, they uh, let me really be by myself when I came here. And I just uh, walked around the grounds trying to get a feel for what happened. And again, uh, paying my respect, you know, to the survivors and uh, the thing. And it was just a weird, weird feeling because I really didn't know how the people were going to react when I come back. You know, they're going to be against me or they're going to hate me or, you know, I had no feeling. But yet I wanted to do this on my own by myself yes. alone. Talking about your life back in the United States, um, let's go back to you know the, the moment after Meet Live. In terms of the images that you saw, that you captured here in Vietnam, how did those images impact you in your return to the United States? They didn't impact me really that much. I really wanted to try to get more into the story, what happened, you know, what happened that day, and really it was we heard nothing. It was. I should say it was a complete cover-up from the top down, what happened on March 16th, 1968. So what happened in order to get those photos published? Okay, uh, what happened, I was giving uh, talks on my uh, tour of duty in the United States Army. I started off first where I was stationed in Hawaii. I show a few pictures on that. Then I'd come to the middle section where I first went to Vietnam, and I showed, you know, what good we were doing over there, and, you know, just general pictures. And I have a whole series what I call Faces of Vietnam, where I just shot like portrait type, you know, 
shots of the you know children, the adults, and that. Then I went on to me live, and people. When I started explaining that story, people were stunned. So when I finished the talk, I started. Any questions? Maybe one or two. Americans don't do this. I mean, we're we're the good good soldiers, and so it's just they couldn't react because they were because of what I described it's to just them. So shocking. It was shocking to them. They just stared, just stared. And again, I asked any questions. Just got up, walked out. One woman I remember uh, accused me of doing this in Hollywood. This was a stage production. They weren't real. I guess people were, you know, did not want to accept that the you know soldiers. No, nobody sometimes... wanted. No, no one wanted to accept that at all. No, no. Mm -mm. Yes, it was not until November twentieth of nineteen sixty nine. Mm -hmm. that the uh, photos uh, you took were the first... The Cleveland Plain Dealer. Yeah, first published right. uh, on right. the Plain Dealer. Right. Why such a long process? I mean, as you said, it was a cover-up? It was around, uh, I believe it was around mid-August, the Criminal Investigation Division, CID, came and questioned me because the lead investigator knew that everyone in Vietnam had a camera with them, so he figured that he'd come and talk to me. And he, I remember him asking me, when we got into the discussion of what happened there that day, I'm describing what I saw, and he's listening. Then he starts asking me one, one question. Did you see any mutilations or rapes? I said, no, I didn't see anything like that. I said, asked, I remember asking him, did that happen? He said, yes. Then he, in turn, started describing to me what happened there that day. Babies, women, teenagers raped, then shot, or the vagina slit. To me, that completely turned me off. And the mutilation part, cutting out of tongues, scalping. I said, no, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Did that happen? I asked him again, you know, because that really kind of, it bothered me. Yes. Then I thought to myself, you know, maybe the public ought to know what's actually going on in Vietnam. Now, these photographs here do not tell a story unless somebody talks about them. You have to talk about these photographs because, yes. you know, there's nobody involved in there doing the actual shooting and that. So. After that, I went to the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Um, I talked to a, a reporter there that I knew back from school. Then I told him uh, my story. He looked at the photographs, and first he thought it was a kook, you know, or to, you know, coming in with something strange. But then he called down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and talked to the uh, prosecutor for Cali. And they tried to get him to stop the company, uh, plane, I should say, the Plain Dealer from publishing them. The Plain Dealer said no, and they published them. They published them. Yep. Do you remember that day? Oh, yes, I remember that day. Yes, tell the, us about the this. The Plain Dealer sold out. They had to do a reprint because, you know, the, the photographs just, I mean, it was on the evening news, you know, Cronkite, all the, the report, everything, all channels, would, you know, t they started to talk about Milai. This um, decision to publish obviously went against the wish. That of, was, well, that was more or less my silent protest against the war. I don't believe in all the violence that was going on and the protesting and that. And I, I don't believe in that. But when I heard about the rapes and the mutilations, especially at the age that it was done, no, I'm sorry. You couldn't accept it. I could accept it. I, I didn't want to accept it. I said, I kept shaking my head. You know, I, it didn't happen. Yes, it happened. You know, I just I couldn't believe something like that would happen. Yes. Now, earlier, our VTV reporter Huang Ling had a chance to accompany Ron Haberly to the trail where he took the photos of the massacre that shook the world. We'll have a listen in the following. 50 years ago, on March the 16th, 1968, Ronald Haberly followed a group of American soldiers to Sun Mi Village in Guangai Province as an army photographer. With two cameras, one of the army and the other of his own, Haberly took searing photos of the killings and house burning by Charlie Company, which was later known to the world as the Mi Lai Massacre. His photos made headlines on the world's biggest newspapers and magazines like Time. Life and Newsweek, he became an important witness of one of the most notorious incidents ever recorded in the history of the U.S. Army. Okay, Ron, here is the picture, the very first one you published uh, about the Milan Massacre. And this is actually where you took the photos. So tell me more about uh, this photo and how did you take it? Okay, what happened in the beginning after our choppers landed? I was walking toward Highway 521 South, and I happened to notice over my shoulder, I heard some rapid firing. I looked over, and I saw soldiers first. I thought they were guarding them. Then all of a sudden, they shot all these people. 
So later on, I determined along with Jay Roberts, we're gonna find these people. So eventually, we came out the trail right ahead, mm -hmm. walked this way, and there was the bodies that I previously uh, seen being shot. So the bodies uh, were actually lying? Lying right here. Lying here. Right here. There were some bodies off in the rice fields too. They weren't just always, you know, in the center part right there. Mm -hmm. So was this the very first image of the Milan massacre that you no, encountered? No, no. There was other images before that that I encountered uh, going down toward Highway 521. Mm -hmm. No, there's other shootings. But this was the one that I wanted to try to find because there was a small child walking out from the rice fields. He was already shot. His oh. arm was hanging and his leg it was always shot in the leg and he was go walking like this, like he was looking for his mother. So I went, knelt down, getting ready to take a photograph, but what I didn't know at the same time, a GI knelt down beside me and shot him. He flipped end over end, and there's a pile of bodies here. I stood up, he stood up. We were about this far away, face-wise. Mm -hmm. I asked him why, why? He looked at me, stare, just turned and walked away. No answer. Oh my God. So it was just, you know. <sighs> so what went through your mind at that time? Oh, that time I was just, you know, I, well, through the whole ordeal, it was like, you know, maybe I wasn't really there. At the, you know, trying, we were trying to figure out what was going on. We tried to confront Captain Medina during the day, but we could never, you know, get to him. We was trying to find out what was going on. But the thing is, everybody says to me, well, why don't you stop Cali? Why don't you stop that? I was attached to the 3rd Platoon going south in Cali, 1st Platoon. I think it was Brooks, the second platoon, went into the village, mm -hmm. and one went up, uh, Brooks went up to Vinte, mm -hmm. and back in Cali was to this part of the village right here. Mm -hmm. So there's you know, no way I could do anything with Cali. I didn't even know who Cali was. During the Mi Lai massacre, Ronald Haberly took a total of some 60 pictures of the horror scenes. The US Army photographer recorded what happened with 18 color photos by his own Nikon camera the authors by the military black and white camera. When you took this photo with your own camera, yes. did you have any plans of maybe one day to let the world know about this? It was in the back of our minds, and Jay and Roberts, Jay Roberts and I talked about this on the way back to our base camp. We said, we figured there was going to be an investigation. We said, let them come to us first, and then we'll tell them the story and we'll turn the film over to them. But we're not going to start the ball rolling, no way. Because up above, there was officers flying around, the choppers, the generals flying around. You could see bodies scattered all over the place, you know. They sure knew about these. Oh, they, I'm sure they knew about They had to, to see the bodies, you know. Here, this pile was right here when they're flying mm -hmm. over. And they're not, you know, super high. Mm -hmm. The cover of it's just from the top down, you know. Because there was a total, I think, 109, you know, VC killed that day. You know, but, but there were only about nine weapons That's recovered. That's a false report. It is, false report. Sure it is. That's the way it was back there. I mean, if you want to get promoted, it's called body count. The whole key to it is body count. How many did you kill today? How many did you kill? I remember being back home before I went, you know, in the sur I was drafted in the service, reading all the stories about these, these num enormous number of Viet Cong killed. But I learned later, they count everything and anything. Estimates, unreal. In an interview with the plane dealer, you admitted to having destroyed uh, a lot of the images two, that you took. Two. Two, two. images. Yes. Uh, why so? Why so? You know, I, pro I processed the film and I had it in strip. And I, you know, I remember looking at the photographs and that and I spotted, you know, two in there actually, you know, of a person or persons doing the shooting. And I thought to myself, no, I, I can't show these who the person, I don't want them to be identified because we're all guilty. Why should I pinpoint two people out of 100 people? Uh, to me, that's wrong, and I thought about it. I procrastinated over it. I kept thinking about it. And finally, one day, I just took the scissors out and yes. cut them up. No, it's true. And they asked me if I had any more photographs. No, I didn't have any more photographs. Yes. That's, that's it, you have them all. So I was honest about that. After the publication of the photo, how was your life impacted? After that, I had to go to you know a few uh, two two of the trials. Having participated in two of the trials, what did you think about the outcome? Did you feel that it was ju just, or did you feel that it was? No, I I have reservations about that because I've always said we're all guilty. I'm guilty of a cover up. There's people guilty of certain things. There are soldiers who shot people that they were out of the service and couldn't be tried. That would take. Uh, 
an act of Congress or the president doing special things that so they have to try all of us. And it's just and another thing that really uh, happened, we had uh, certain soldiers had to go through the, uh, before the Senate subcommittee, Armed Services Committee, and they did not turn any uh, paperwork over to the defense attorneys. So that is why a lot of charges against these soldiers got dropped because nobody could testify because they didn't give the information to the defense attorney. They kept it secret. And it, all of a sudden, it keeps, it's, here's Kelly at the bottom. It keeps funneling down. Finally, to, to it gets down to about, about you know, two or three different uh, people. Yes. And just Where, in fact, it was a, a group of people. It was a whole kind of, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, from top down, basically. Top down. Right. Exactly. It, it funneled right down to uh, Lieutenant Kelly. Yes. Going back to the photos that got published, um, I believe the, the photos, uh, as you said, uh, the feedback from people around you were, you know, 20-25 percent complimentary and the rest uh, did not like it. No. For the rest of America, it also divided the country. Oh, very much divided the country and that divided because they were starting out, uh, they are going more to, you know, Cali's side because he was the only one singled out for punishment. The only one out of the about 100 some people, 125 people that could have been charged. He was the only one. But what really kind of bothers me too, everybody says Charlie Company, Charlie Company. What about B Company over at my key? 97 people over there. You know, it happened in Vinte. Yes. About 20 people, that's where most of the rapes took place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I think this, this whole investigation was done in, the, our government, I believe, started to want to cover up of everything of this, and you can see how it funneled down. Yes. That's my personal opinion. The ceremony marking the 50th year since the Meat Lai Massacre has gathered the attention of many press members, and many international uh, delegations of media agencies are here in Guangai to cover the event. In the following, we'll learn more about why five decades on, the subject of Meat Lai continues to attract the attention of many press members. Thirteen press delegations were present at the memorial ceremony nearly half coming from media and press agencies in Japan. Akiko Suzuki is the bureau chief in Vietnam, Cambodia and the Philippines for Asahi Shimbun, one of Japan's most respected daily newspapers. Its daily circulation is ranked among the top in the world with more than six million copies. Suzuki shares the reason why she thinks so many media agencies in Japan are interested in covering the ceremony, marking 50 years since 504 civilians in Sanmi were slaughtered. She says perhaps it's because Japan, like Vietnam, has also been through the ravages of war. I think many Japanese are still interested in you know, thinking about the war. It is a part of our, I think, life. Even I am born after the war, you know, but I think that's why we are so interested in uh, the war, and especially in Vietnam, you know, of course, you are also, I think, um, living in a country uh, where the American war was a huge part of your history. And as a an correspondent, luckily to be here in Vietnam, I was really interested to learn about you know what happened and how people are thinking about the war, how you are trying to overcome. Suzuki was present in My Lai a day before the actual ceremony to find witnesses to the tragic events 50 years earlier. She has been most touched in speaking with the survivors of the massacre. I was impressed by the strength of the people who um, talked to me as if they have you know, I cannot believe they are the survivors because they looked so strong and kind in remembering what happened. The 50th year commemoration of the My Lai Massacre attracted the attention of not only the world's major press groups, but also many independent journalists. Freelancer Jeff Skinner bought a ticket himself to fly from Australia to Vietnam in order to join in the ceremony. This is his third visit to My Lai, and yet the event for which this land has come to be known for has been a subject of interest for more than 30 years. He has read, researched, and contemplated what has happened here. I feel for the Vietnamese people and survivors, 
Um, how they can still welcome us is very hard for me to imagine when even Hugh Thompson, the helicopter pilot, who's one of the true heroes of this massacre, he finds it hard to forgive his own people, yet the Vietnamese forgive his people. So it's, um, it's all very overwhelming. Skinner has his own reasoning as to why the international press is still covering My Lai linked to a massacre that took place half a century ago. The free world is getting fed up with conflicts. Um, it's not it's ha happened in Vietnam and My Lai, but it's happening in the Middle East. Um, in other parts of the world, there's tragedies occurring. Hugh, in his, one of his last interviews, he said it, it, what he witnessed reminded him of Nazi Germany. It's sad and it shouldn't happen. Many people um, here in Vietnam included believe that the photos that you publish, um, not only you know first on the plane dealer, but later on, a lot of people the world over knew about it through the Life magazine. Um, those photos, as many believe, help in a way to change the course of the war. I'm for myself, you know, some, watching documentaries on you know Vietnam and that, and they bring up My Lai, and it was basically almost a turning point of the war. And that it, it just started to have it, you know, after that, a downturn. Did you ever think about what would have happened if those photos never got onto the plane dealer? I feel if uh, nobody was on, if there was not a photographer on the operation, I'm sure some soldier would complain about it and it'd be sent in, you know, for investigation. But I think without the photographs, it'd been slipped under the rug because. They say a photograph's worth 10,000 words. These photographs aren't worth anything unless somebody talks about them. Somebody has to talk about them. And when they took my photographs and went around to reinvestigate some of the soldiers they previously talked to, it jarred the memory. They were able to tell a lot more what happened that day. Does the thought of Vietnam kind of come back to you uh, in the years after you came back to, to, to the United States? Did you kind of follow the news on what happened in Vietnam? I mainly followed the news. I tried to get much, as much information as I you know, could from the news. Mm -hmm. And I always, in my back of my mind, I told myself, I'm going to return one of these days. That was, that was my pr uh, primary thought. I will return to the site. And you've returned many times oh, many since times, then. Yes, yes. What do you think, you know, after 50 years, what, what do you think keeps you coming back to this place? I think it would be wrong for me if I came back to Vietnam to not stop at Milai. I was a part of it, part of history. And when I come back, I learn a few different little things too. And it's, the most impressive thing to me is when I'm able to go with an interpreter without somebody calling on the phone all the time, what's he saying, what's he saying, you know, this little, what we call the little secret police. And which makes it interesting is to stop a person walking the trail that's an older person. And we did that. I don't think this person's ever been interviewed before that, that I know of. Anyway, we start asking uh, her or him to tell the story. Immediately, tears start streaming down their eyes or telling the story, and the translator is trans translating immediately to me what she's saying or he's saying. And it just, it just takes it's basically my breath away. Uh, hearing the story that they're describing, their sadness at the, for that day and that, it's just, but I learn. Can you tell us about one story that you heard that particularly touched you? Or, uh, or... It was the one where I was taking around. Uh, they were doing another documentary. I mean, they were doing the filming and that. And I said, you know, we just talked to some of the people, you know, that are walking on the trail. And I said, how about that woman? So went over there, camera rolling and everything. And she started telling her story about the helicopters coming in. They thought, you know, everything was going to be fine. It's like this. And all of a sudden, they started he heard shooting. They seen people running. So this person just took off and hid. And it's just, you know, it's but but they when she described the aftermath after the you know soldiers left, I mean it was, it was so sad. Bodies here, who's who? I mean uh, everybody, you know, here it has you know a relation of some sort. And it was just trying to identify the remains and the uh, the, uh, the remains, some of them, you know, hardly any remains left from what, they, what was going on. And tell her story was I'm just right there listening to what she had to say. For you personally, listening to those stories, mm -hmm. how did those stories impact you? They impacted me because I was able to learn more what happened there that day. And every time I hear somebody, you know, a civilian here in the village speak, again, as I've always said, I learn more. And it makes, it makes me feel so sad when I hear that story. 
I mean, that's, I mean, I just can't believe what they're saying. And I just, that I have to believe it because they witnessed it. But yet it has to be told to other people, not just me. Among the many people returning to meet live this time, Ron is not the only American veteran. In the following, we'll follow the footsteps of some other American veterans to see why they have come back to meet Lai. The stories and images of the massacre that happened 50 years ago are still seared into the minds of these war veterans, even though they weren't the ones who committed the heinous acts. We were like a bunch of foolish kids with guns back then. Yeah, I'm gonna go kill people. And from the movies you watched and all the propaganda, and the nonsense you get in, in about you're the greatest country in the world and, and, and whatnot. But then the reality of it is it, 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 it knocks that out. I just couldn't understand what our mission was or why we were really even here. In fact, I became, you know, very suicidal. Of course, I was not here during the war, but still I feel the responsibility a strong sense of what is good, what is evil. And if one commits evil, then one must atone for the evil. Even if nobody else does, I must atone for that evil. For the past 25 years, Mike Bone and several other U.S. war veterans have been raising funds from sponsors and using their own money to help poor women in Quang Nai province. Due to his contributions, the Provincial Women's Association of Kuang Nai has made him an honorary member. It's really addressing the evils that our country did to Vietnam in a very direct and individual, people to people way. Each time I came back and then living here for a year, oh. It's like, it's reclaiming your life back. It's being reborn. Baum has helped build three primary schools and 57 houses, and has helped provide local women with 3,000 microloans in San Mi and 14 other poor villages in Quang Nai province, contributing to healing the pain left by the war. I'm happy to see the prosperity. I'm happy that the children now have hope for the future. That makes me very happy. Remember the past, but work for the future. He's more than 70 years old now. However, he's promised to himself that as long as he's alive, he'll keep returning to Quang Nai to be a bridge that connects people to this place and to help alleviate some of the pain the war left here. Going back to Vietnam uh, for so many times now, and particularly back here to meet Lai, how have you seen uh, the lives of the people, I mean, um, you know, 50 years on, how, how do you think they've kind of overcome or not overcome the, the From my understanding, the, the Vietnamese suffering. have the will to forgive. That's my understanding, and I, I, I feel they do, but they don't forget. For the people of uh, the Sun Meat Village and the people around here in Meat Lai, what would you say to them, you know, if you had a chance? First thing I'd say, I apologize what happened there that day. I wish it would have never happened. It was a tragic day. It should not have happened. There were no combatants in the area. It was just something that got out of hand. It just, it was wrong. And the next thing I would say is, please tell your story. <laughs> is extended to present flowers, including by American veterans seeking reconciliation in the land that is developing day by day. On this occasion, 600 members of the U.S. Veterans for Peace signed an apology to the Vietnamese people. We acknowledge that this terrible massacre was a clear atrocity, but also we recognize that it was not an anomaly, that it is one of many such abominations that many of our soldiers inflicted on the people of Vietnam during the American War. We who were directly engaged in this war will continue to publicly confess our complicity in your country's suffering. It expresses our deep remorse, our regret, 
our sorrow as Americans for what happened here and for our shared responsibility. When we come here to the Milai Memorial, we are reminded of the past and that horrible massacre. But then look around and we see the children, the hope of Vietnam. So sadness and hope at the same time. What Americans must do is do more than attend the ceremony, cry a little bit. They must help build schools and dig wells and give loans to poor women. To mark the 50th anniversary of the My Lai Massacre that took the lives of 504 San Mi villagers, Vietnamese and Americans alike show their mutual feelings. They offer incense to mourn the fallen and hope for peace, just like the wish of the U.S.'s veterans. We cannot undo the wrongs we have done, but we will use our remorse to work for world peace. For the people visiting the sites here, um, seeing your photos that have gone into history, what would you say to them? I just basically, if somebody's looking at the photographs, just hope something like this never happens again. But you wonder, can it happen again? Maybe, maybe not. Anytime there's a war, you, you have no idea what goes on. A lot of the people that have never you know, been in the service and that have no idea what's, what's really happening. Journalism has changed because of the me live photographs. Yeah. The truth, the truth came out and it's very hard for the people to take the truth, mm -hmm. to believe it. Here in Sun Mi Village, Ron Haberly has a very special friend by the name of Tin Van Duk, and Duk was among the few survivors of the Mi Lai massacre years ago. Every time I come to Vietnam, I've always met Duk and his family and that. It's a great feeling to see him and you know, meet up with them. And, it, it, it feels close. I have a close feeling with this family. This is the camera that Ron Haberly used to capture the images that would shock the world. The images of the My Lai Massacre of March 16th, 1968. The camera holds a special significance for Tron Van Duk, a survivor of the massacre. The camera means something to him probably more than it does to me. To me, it was just a device to record an event. What I did record was Duke, his sister Ha, and his mother, which I later found out about. So I figured, you know, the camera, I believe, would be, be, more, be more at home with Duck. So I <clears throat> brought the camera with me to Saigon. We were all sitting around talking. I presented the camera to Duck. Duck, I think, for a few minutes was speechless. He was just took the camera held it, brought it up to his eyes. Duke recounts how on the day of the massacre, he used his own body to shield his little sister Ha from the bullets being fired all around them. Their mother only had enough time to show Duke the path towards which he could run and save his sister. Their mother did not make it, shot dead by American soldiers shortly after. A mother murdered, her children running to escape. Both images captured by Ron. With the duck sisters crying and duck crying, um, it really brought a lot of emotion out. I mean, I almost started crying, you know, and I think that um, I feel bad. I feel bad I, that this had to happen to somebody, and it's not fair. The very first encounter Ron and Duke had was in September of 2011. Since then, their friendship has flourished. Từ lúc chúng tôi đã ra tình bạn, dường như những cái gì Ron muốn, Ron đấu tranh, Ron quan tâm, tôi cũng như vậy. Giống như người trong một gia đình rồi. Our lives have been brought together because of this incident, and it'll remain forever. My friendship with Doug means quite a bit with me. It means it's special to me. We're one.
as we've seen in uh, the previous clip, we saw your, uh, you know, friendship with Mr. Chen Benduk, who is a survivor um, from, you know, the Meat Line Massacre. Mm -hmm. um, and he was actually photographed in, in your, uh, you know, uh, by, by you. Two children on the trail. Correct. Yes, he and his sister. Yes. Um, can you tell us about how you came to know uh, Mr. Duk? Well, it was in the summer of uh, 2011 on Facebook. I received a message from a German filmmaker, and he asked me if I was a Me Live photographer. I said, yes, I'm the Me Live photographer. I answered him. And they said, do you know the two children that you photographed on trail are alive? I said, no. I, I assumed they were shot because of you know, all the firing going around me and that. And uh, he says, no, they're alive. They're alive. OK, fine. So it makes a long story short, we kind of, you know, Duck and I started to correspond a little bit. Yes. You know. And he was in Ger Germany. He was in Germany, yeah, Remscheid, Germany. And uh, we were corres corresponding back. So finally, uh, they wanted to come, uh, I should say, the cinematographer wanted to come, you know, do the story on Duck, which he, was, he already started doing with the filming over here. And he wanted to do it back in my hometown. So. I wrote a letter to help Duck get a passport, you know, to the U.S. And finally, it was in September. The two of them showed up, and we started doing a little filming here. Then we sat down at the table uh, one day. And we started talking about the story, and I had my slides out and looking at that. And previously, before Duck came, I was able to acquire uh, the memo he wrote about his life in 2010, written in 2010. So I'm reading it over, and I happen to notice that he thinks of me, um, he thought of me in a helicopter, taking his picture. So then I let it, later on, I, a little bit lower, I read about him noticing a helicopter, you know, above. He was kind of trying to hide from the helicopter. So when Duck arrived at my house, we're going through, you know, the talking and uh, filming, and I sat back and I said, Duck, will you describe the helicopter to me? What did it look like? Because I wasn't in a helicopter. I was on the ground photographing you. He said it was white in the front. I look in my slides right there as a shark in sequence, yes. which is the main. That's my of... right. That's my main key. Here's duck. He notices the helicopter. He notices the helicopter. We got another shot of the bodies on 521. Three bodies, non-combatants. Putting it all together in sequence. To me, he's telling me the truth. Exactly. That's the way. That's the way I felt. Knowing Duke for, for the many years that you've known him yes. now, uh, what do you think, you know, is representative in Duke in terms of kind of the survivors uh, you've, you've met so far? Duke is like all the rest of the survivors. I mean, they all have feelings. I mean, they, don't, they can't really forgive, you know, the Americans what they did, but yet they're trying to go on and you know, lead a normal life. And to me, that's fantastic if they you want to do that. I don't, I, don't, I don't expect anybody to forgive us, no. I mean, what we did was wrong, no. Can you share with us, what do you hope for Meet Lai, the people here, and the future? I hope the people here have a chance to prosper and grow, you know. Basically, I've heard uh, Quang Nai is one of the poorer provinces in that, and I think they need a little bit, you know, help, say from that, you know, especially with the education. My, per my thing I like to see too is our government help with the Agent Orange situation. That's, that, that's a sad situation over here right now. They tr they've done some cleanup, but there's a lot more to do. Well, thank you very much, Ron, oh, thank you. for sharing your story. Um, and I wish you all the best luck in your future endeavors, that you'll continue to come back here to Vietnam. Oh, I'll definitely come back here to Vietnam. Um, I, I and, and to meet Lai, to, yeah. to learn more about the, the story. Thank you very much. And that has also wrapped up our edition of Talk Vietnam coming to you from Quang Lai, marking the 50th year since the Meat Lai Massacre. As we saw in this edition, the photos of Ron Haberly, along with other press agencies, the recounts of veterans and the voices of peace lovers the world over have all helped to unveil the truth about the Meat Lai Massacre and Sun Meat Village. Thanks to these efforts, the question no longer remains about what happens here in Sun Mi, but rather how to ensure that nothing so horrible will ever happen in the world again. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Talk Vietnam. We'll see you next time. Goodbye for now.